Welcome back to Alto University 5G Hack the Mall summer course. The next lesson will concern the 5G physical layer. It's given by Antti Toskala from Nokia Bell Labs. So welcome from my behalf as well to this course. So I said, my name is Antti Toskala working here in Nokia Bell Labs in Espoo, Finland. And I will be entertaining you about the 5G physical layer today. So in today's presentation, we will cover what are the key 5G technology components. Uh, we will compare a bit that, okay, what's the difference between 3G, 4G and 5G physical layer. We look at 5G spectrum and, and uh, related numerology. We look at the wave, discuss the waveform, and uh, in more details, then we go through the frame structures, channel coding, decoding, beamforming, MIMO, and finally, this uh, physical layer one channel structures. And then summary at the end. In most cases, we will focus and try to elaborate what's the difference to the previous generations, especially with uh, LTE. And uh, commercial part of the presentation is on the side, this suggested additional reading material. So if you think about what are the key elements that make 5G different from what we have today uh, in, on the field, on the 4G side. So first of all, we need to be able to address new spectrum resources because uh, we are having much more spectrum available as we go to the higher frequency bands. And, and that cause more flexibility and capability on the radio side. At the same time, the existing frequency bands, of course, that ha are deployed are not going anywhere, and there's a need to be able to reform those. Beamforming is another element which has been used to a certain extent in the previous generations, but now with 5G, it's, uh, it's exploited to the full extent from covering both control and data as, as, as well. Uh, further, if you think about this kind of slicing, flexibility, coming from the physical layer point of view that uh, you have much more freedom to configure the physical layer structures, which then allows to create, for example, carrier structures that would be very energy efficient if the network is not heavily loaded compared to LTE. And then the fourth, fourth element highlighting here impacting the radio is the multi-connectivity. That is something that uh, standards for 4G did contain support for the multi-connectivity, but it was never ever really implemented in the field. Now, the very first 5G devices, all of them are designed to operate with this multi-connectivity, meaning that uh, you are running 5G and LTE simultaneously. So two transmitters, two receivers active on different radio technologies, which of course boost the performance and capacity compared to single radio operation. So if you look at glance that what is then differentiating 5G over 3G or 4G, that many of you have been familiar with uh, from your earlier studies, work experience, or at least the phone in your pocket has 3G and 4G in it. Uh, in 3G days, of course, uh, uh, the, way, the way for multiple access, what is called code division multiple access, CDMA. With uh, 4G, we move to the use of off DMA in downlink direction. And now with 5G, we have introduced that in the uplink direction as well but still retaining the single carrier operation uh, in, in, in addition to that. Uh, channel coding, uh, we chose the more uh, high data friendly LDPC coding for, for data operation in, in 5G side. And the beam forming is now something that is really catering to full operation, not only for data, but includes the control signaling, initial access, and so forth. 
The spectrum bands we are now enabling and supporting uh, go beyond uh, what, uh, what LT has, has, has been capable of supporting. Typically, LT deployments on the license bands did not go in some markets uh, higher than 2.5. Some markets went to like 3.5 gigahertz frequency band. Okay, some unlicensed up to six. But now with 5G, we are enabling these millimeter wave frequency range operation that in practice in the first phase means the frequency bands around 26, 28 gigahertz or 39 gigahertz frequency range. The resulting bandwidth is going from 20 megahertz bandwidth, then as a minimum, the, all the devices that support these uh, low frequency bands go to up to 100 megahertz, or if we go to millimeter wave, then is uh, 200 or even 400 megahertz. So depending on the, on the frequency range, could be five, 10 times, 20 times as that of LTE. So, so that will, the additional elements will bring more energy efficient network. So it will be low latency with faster decoding as we'll discuss shortly. And many solutions from LTE are further optimized to make them better or many things were specified in LTE but were never ever used in the field, like the mentioned uh, dual connectivity I took up earlier. So spectrum point of view, the millimeter waves, uh, higher frequency bands, of course, changes the situation uh, from the practical deployment point of view. The antennas become small and then we can create these kind of very narrow beams in our transmission, not anymore transmitting the full sector. Uh, if we compare these uh, centimeter waves, so lower frequency bands, there uh, the antennas are then, uh, then, uh, then, then larger and you cannot have that many antennas in, in, in practice. So the higher we go in the frequency, uh, you, 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 you can use more antennas, uh, but there's of course also the practical desire to use more antennas because the single attenuation increases. So you want to use the beam forming higher antenna gains to compensate for that one. Then basically the higher frequency bands are really this high capacity booster, whereas the low frequency bands of course remain the ones used to deliver this necessary coverage in the wide area sense. If we are looking at the frequency bands in the first phase, then um, uh, especially in the European market, this uh, 3.5 gigahertz range is, is in the highlight. So we are talking about, uh, in, in the standards term, we are talking about N77, N78 frequency bands, where operators in many markets typically get up to this uh, 100 megahertz of, uh, of, of bandwidth. And, um, and that is also something that is uh, mandatory for devices to support. Uh, there are several existing LT bands that also are specified as 5G bands. Uh, on this millimeter wave range, um, in many markets, uh, those are still waiting to be taken into use or waiting also this kind of auctions to follow. So there an operator could have maybe 400, 800, even up to one gigahertz of spectrum available. And that of course then creates a clear, uh, a clear improvement in terms of what kind of data rates you can, you can make happen. On some markets, uh, uh, if you think about the 3.5, the operators will not always get 100 megahertz of spectrum. So they have to live with, uh, with the smaller smaller chunk in that case and don't get necessarily all the, all the maximum data rates. But in that case, the dual connectivity with LT comes important because then you can aggregate the data rate between the LT bands. If you now look then on the numerology of 5G, uh, in LT we had only one numerology, one subcarrier spacing, Okay, we had some alternatives, what kind of cyclic prefix you could have, be that for uh, 
a difficult propagation condition or some broadcast use, which latter one is ne never really flew on the marketplace. But now with 5G, we are introducing a larger set of subcarrier spacings. So we go from the 15 kilohertz, which was the same as LTE, we use on this uh, small, lower frequency bands 30 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, which is expected to be widely used and is widely used in the field already with this 3.5 gigahertz frequency bands, for example. And with that kind of numerology, we enable maximum of uh, 100 megahertz practical carrier bandwidth. Uh, we do have also 60 gigahertz, uh, uh, 60 kilohertz uh, subcarrier spacing in place that not foreseen so much to be used and it's optional for the devices. But from then for the millimeter waves, we have this 120 kilohertz subcarrier spacing for overall use and then additionally 240, but that's only for this data uh, control part of the channel synchronization signals if, if desired. So in practice will be 15 kilohertz for very low frequency bands, 30 kilohertz for mid bands 2.5, 3.5 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz, and then 120 for the millimeter waves. Uh, if we look, how does this subcarrier spacing then impact elements like simple duration? Well, in practice, when you double the subcarrier spacing, then your simple duration uh, in time gets halved, which means that your 14 simple frame uh, is is the short that much shorter how much you have increased subcarrier spacing so with the 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing uh, we scheduling interval was one millisecond as in LTE 14 symbols but now when we go to this uh, for example 30 kilohertz it's only half of that uh, half a millisecond or 120 kilohertz it's only one eighth of the milliseconds which is a one component that enables for reduced latency when the scheduling interval gets shorter. Additionally, as we discussed later, there are these kind of mini slots that you don't always need to allocate so many symbols as 14 to reduce the latency even further and also enable reducing the latency if you're operating on the low frequency bands using 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing. Waveform is always an interesting topic when we start defining a new generation and often the topic of a uh, lot of debates. Do we keep something from the old or do we create something new? In this case, in, in downlink direction, it's off DMA as in, uh, in, uh, in LTE. In uplink, LTE was using the single carrier uplink only to enable uh, high efficient uh, a high power transmission where you have this low peak to average ratio, so you have a high amplifier efficiency. Now we have retained that, but have added also off DMA, autoconnect frequency division multiple access there. Uh, the intention is that when you have enough power available, when you can use perhaps multi-stream MIMO transmission, then you use off DMA, that performs better in that kind of case. While when are you approaching the sellage area, you are power limited, you cannot afford multi-stream transmission, then you would use the single carrier FDMA that allows to use low peak to average ratio and gets you maximum output from this power amplifier from the device. So power amplifier efficiency is indeed the key so that uh, you can uh, achieve low power consumption and also manage uh, with the device thermal design that you don't have to dissipate too much heat out of, out of the device because of amplifier as you anyway have a lot of other processing that cr creates a lot of heat in, inside the device. Uh, release 15 was that. Release 17, we are starting to look of this 60 to 71 gigahertz frequency band, which is certain extent unlicensed band used by some fixed links as well, uh, part, partly <coughs> Uh, will be licensed frequency. So there we are looking to uh, add, add additional subcarrier spacings, even larger ones, 
because we have to fight the phase noise. As the higher we go in the frequency, the larger the phase noise goes. And uh, using too low subcarrier spacing would mean that these off DMA subcarriers would be no longer orthogonal to each other. Release 18, we expect that uh, we will start investigating uh, how do we support even higher frequency bands and their new waveforms become more likely because when you have larger and larger bandwidths uh, with, uh, with the off DMA, huge number, number of subcarriers becomes impractical and is not very energy efficient way of then transmitting the signal. But that's something to be looked at later. In the standards, we have already developed the channel model up to 114 kilohertz. So this is where this number called it here comes. But the uh, release 18 work, of course, will only start sometime after, uh, after this year. So now going to the physical frame structure, we do support both FTD and TDD mode of operation. FTD where the separate frequency for uplink and downlink transmission and TDD where you share the one carrier between uplink and downlink in time domain. And that is the first, first phase focus with this 3.5 gigahertz frequency. That is a TDD spectrum by the allocation. And, uh, and there you can have dynamic uplink downlink allocation, though in practice you have to have some kind of fixed uplink downlink pattern and you need to align with the neighbor operator unless you are in this kind of isolated environment. The frame structure has a clear difference to LTE because like you can see on the left hand side, we have the LTE reference signals and they are scattered around in time and frequency domain inside the frame, which means that when you are receiving the LTE frame, you first have to buffer the frame and only that you are able to uh, uh, create the channel estimate and start decoding the channel. The idea with the 5G channel structure is that in the beginning of the frame, you have the control signaling. After that comes the reference signals and then the actual data symbols follow after that, which means that you can start the decoding process as soon as the data symbols start coming. No need to wait until end of the frame. It works that way as shown here on the right hand side, when the device velocity mobility is reasonable with the higher velocity environments, you need to add additional reference signals later to, as, as the channel would be changing too much during the frame. Five G channel coding was one of the hot topics in the discussions uh, that what to do there. Do we reuse what we have been using in the earlier generation? With, in 3G, we had the turbo coding, or do we do something new here? And the selection was that we do LDPC, low density parity check type of decoder, uh, which was known technology all the way from the space flights going to the Wi-Fi technology, but we did modify that a lot for 5G use to make it more efficient to deal with this physical air retransmissions, you, you name it, to be more performing, more efficient, more flexible. Uh, the motivation indeed for this LDPC was that uh, the area efficiency, it's really unbeatable if we compare to the other alternatives on the table. And still it, de it delivers basically the same performance as the other alternatives because eventually if we are looking for gigabit range uh, data rates, then it's again important that we don't use too much energy and make the chip run too, too high from the temperature point of view. Uh, for this uh, uh, layer one control signaling, we can use polar coding. We have read Muller in some case repetition. That's not so critical because uh, the data rates are, are, are low so it's not, uh, not uh, the decisive factor from the overall performance point of view, but really what matters is what you do with data when you have several gigabits to decode in, 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 in a short time.
So now, if we compare the actual processing times with LTE, we can see that uh, with 5G, the requirement for device processing is that it's really fast. But of course, we have to take into account that it was some 10 years ago when we specified LTE. So of course, the technology evolution has moved onwards as well. I have here the best example in that sense that it's an FTD example, that, uh, which means that I have uplink and downlink available all the time. And in this example, it's less than a slot when the data transmission has ended, when the device has decoded the data and is already able to send feedback in uplink direction, whether, that whether the packet was received correctly or not. And uh, this allows uh, then the base station to react fast and basically only three slots later to send in the fourth slot, then already retransmission if the previous packet transmission was failing. Or if it did not fail, then the new transmission would come. So when LT would be processing then these three full slots at the same time when 5G is getting already a retransmission, LT side would, is already only at that point in time starting to send feedback in uplink direction to the base station, whether the packet was received uh, correctly or not. So there are multiple elements that really make it faster. Again, the faster decoding time is, is one of them. TDD adds some extra complexity and, and burden here because um, you don't have always uplink or downlink available. So you have to wait when you can send your feedback signaling and when, when again is the time to send the retransmission. So TDD operation adds more latency here, but TDD of course is typically used a little bit on the higher frequency bands where at least this uh, uh, scheduling interval is shorter so it cuts down the value here. You can have more hybrid RQ processes than shown here, because um, if you have this kind of deployment that you have a, like a baseband hotel, a lot of stuff away from the base station side and some of the processing would be done f far further away from the radio side where you have a radio over fiber and an RF and possibly other elements on the radio side, then you can create more processing time for the backhole network by having higher number of hybrid RQ processes. But the example here shown with four processes is the fastest you can do. On the top right hand corner, you can see some of the processing time requirements for the devices that how many symbols there is time. And here this front loaded DMRS refers to this uh, demodulation reference signal signals is the example that I was shown that only one point in time I have reference signals. This additional DMRS refers to this high velocity case. And then of course the devices need more processing time because uh, they need to wait longer to get all the reference data before they can demodulate uh, the frame. And different values, so different subcarriage spacings. I've used this 15 kilohertz and 30 kilohertz here as an example as those are the most deployed alternatives as of today. Mini slot is one of the further concepts that uh, that uh, has been has been introduced in release 15. Uh, that allows that uh, we can schedule less than 14 symbols, seven, four, or down to two symbols to create really fast transmission that doesn't take long time. And this is especially relevant if you think about this uh, sub one gigahertz frequency range where we would be using this typically 15 kilohertz sub carrier spacing, normally one millisecond uh, scheduling interval. But now in that kind of environment, we can also cut the delay, not only from a faster processing time, but also from this uh, shorter scheduling interval. This was important that that this was included in release 15. It may not be that vital for the really first phase deployments, but this allows also in the low frequency bands, if you're going for some ultra low latency, high reliability uh, deployment uh, use case to get the, the really low latencies with the lower frequency bands as well 
and not only on this 3.5 or millimeter wave spectrum. So then let's look at the beamforming more. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we can have much more antennas now, but, uh, but as, as the antenna size is smaller, then the relative size is not that different from the low band antennas. The antennas you see in the field as of today usually might be a little bit wider, but not, then not as tall as those uh, existing low frequency band antennas. And that's true both on the pay station side and mobile side. Mobiles also, especially when you go to the millimeter side, millimeter wave bands, they do have more than just one or two antennas. So they have uh, easily uh, two or even three set, set of batch antennas on the millimeter wave. So beamforming really allows to boost the capacity and uh, compensate for the part of the loss in the link budget with some limitations that, of course, this millimeter wave 28 gigahertz will not be as good as these uh, rollouts on, on the really on the low bands. But some of the loss is compensated with that. So now this beamforming operation uh, has been designed to take into account the fact that when you go to this kind of hybrid beamforming, which means that you have much more antenna elements than you have actually antenna ports. So it's partly digital, partly analog. That means that the base station can only transmit one beam direction, one antenna direction at a time, and the same way on the reception side, which means that uh, this Wi-Fi G will use on the layer one this kind of what I call beam sweep or beam switching that uh, you take turns and send to different beam directions at the time. First beam, beam zero, one, so forth. The device will try to measure and decode all of the transmissions from all of the beams, which are otherwise more or less identical, but they of course contain the identification of the beam, the number of the beam in use. So that the device can then give a beam quality feedback which beam was best for me. Devices also have this kind of directivity at the millimeter wave operation so that uh, uh, they can tell, uh, they can select set of antennas that is best suited for transmission towards the base station for various reasons, how the device is positioned or my hand may be on top of the one set of antennas so the device should be able to select another set of antennas in that case. If we look at this uh, beamforming and MIMO multiple input, multiple output antenna operation, we have different kind of philosophies, approaches possible from the standard point of view. This shows a couple of perhaps a little bit simplified examples. The standard itself allows uh, different alternatives. One approach is that there is only one, the channel state information reference signal being sent and Basically, device gives the feedback, feedback to our base station, which then uh, calculates the antenna weights so that a good signal reception can be achieved by the base station. Other approach that, uh, like having multiple of these CSIRs, where we combine basically this kind of beam selection with this uh, code book feedback, and uh, you select from the limited number of beams, as, as we are not operating yet on the millimeter waves, and then the base station then computes which kind of beam direction to use and, and selects the suitable code book and downlink transmission. The approach without feedback is this uh, SRS based, sounding reference signal based, where the idea is that because in TDD, it's the same part of the spectrum you use in uplink, and downlink. So the idea is that uh, when the device sends towards the base station this kind of sounding reference signal, the base station measures that in which part of the spectrum, for example, and then how do I receive that signal, and based on that calculates that what is the best way of sending towards 
to that base station, to that device, in terms of which part of the spectrum and what kind of uh, uh, transmitter antenna weights to use. When we go to the millimeter waves, high frequency bands, then this hybrid beam forming, as I mentioned, kicks to the play. And depending, do we use single panel array or multi panel array? There are different approaches we can take how, how to operate the system. In the single, single user MIMO situation, we would have this kind of one panel with cross polarized antennas, and we would end up sending one beam at a time and uh, using this cross polarization, creating this two stream MIMO transmission. The interesting impact of the high frequency operation here is the fact that uh, we actually end up using low frequency bands, maybe two MIMO antennas and MIMO streams, mid bands, four MIMO antennas, MIMO streams. But when we go to very high frequencies, millimeter waves, we, the environment is such that we cannot create any more so many independent transmissions for one device. So then we end up using uh, one, one stream or two stream MIMO transmission at most. Now the approach is that if you are able to introduce uh, multiple uh, of, these, uh, uh, of these panels in, in, in place, so then we can create this kind of multi-user MIMO operation with this multi-panel case, that we do have one panel sending one beam to one direction at a time, but when we have four of those panels together, we can, we can send uh, uh, multiple transmissions towards one device, or more practical is, is, is expected to be this kind of multi-user MIMO, where we do have these multiple panels and we are simultaneously serving multiple devices at a time, each of them served by their own part in the, in the antenna array. And that time increasing the maximum cell level peak data rate, but not increasing what is the maximum data rate for one given device. And the practical devices are not really expected to support this kind of A-stream, A-stream MIMO in the millimeter wave, but uh, that's why this multi-user MIMO is the one becoming the practical one. So then, if you look the layer one channel structures in more detail, what kind of channels we have. So overall, the set of channels is pretty similar compared to LTE. We have physical downlink share channel for data. We have a physical uplink share channel for data in the uplink direction. We have broadcast channel and, and downlink control channel for control information in downlink and uplink control and random access channel for access to the system. The downlink physical signals have a little bit more difference. Also from the naming point of view, we have some of the new things like uh, face tracking reference signals that did not exist in LT side. Interestingly, compared to LT, we don't have these common reference signals we used to have in the, in the past. Primary synchronization, secondary synchronization signals are those that you use to, to search the network in the first phase and those create this physical cell ID in the network. Synchronization signals and broadcast channel, they construct what we call like SS block basically. Shown here is this four simple structure that has the primary and secondary synchronization signal that tells you what is the physical cell ID, and then there is this broadcast information to enable accessing the network. This uh, relatively small text then here on the table indicates that what kind of SS block bandwidth we have in different subcarrier spacings intended for different frequency bands. And that actually determines that what is the minimum bandwidth you can use with, with, with 5G. We can see that uh, with the 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, the SS block structure itself is this 3.6 uh, megahertz. So that means that really you cannot go too much below five megahertz in the actual bandwidth you need to roll out 5G. Uh, 
5G is not possible to be used in some 1 to 3 megahertz bandwidth. It's just uh, the design basic structures are too wide for the narrowband operation. When we go to higher frequency bands, then we can also have a larger number of beams. With this uh, sub-6 gigahertz spectrum, we can have maximum of eight beams, depending on the parameterization, while with this high frequency band, we can have up to 64 beams. Uh, the simple duration is also an important element here, because with the high subcarrier spacing, the simple duration is small, and then if you recall the beam sweep, then we can afford to do the beam sweep because otherwise the beam sweep would be lasting too long if you would like to do, try to support too many beams on the low frequency bands. But this SS block is the key thing. This is what the devices will search for when you power up your device and it starts to look for a 5G network, whether that's available or not. Uh, for the downlink control channels and signals, so we have this physical downlink control channel that is telling for a device that where do you find your downlink channel, uh, your downlink data that you need to receive. And there's this kind of common and UE specific search base. So where to look, so if you think of 3.5 gigahertz carrier, it's 100 megahertz carrier. So there are certain points in time, uh, in, sorry, in frequency that the device will check is there a matching control channel for me where the CRC check gives the right result? If yes, I decode it and then receive the data accordingly. There's link adaptation in the form of PDCC format so that for device close to the base station you allocate uh, less resource element groups, so less, less bits actually, whereas device at the cell edge, then you can allocate a lot of resources to make sure the signal is reliable transmitted. On the small picker, figure on, on, on the bottom, you can see this is what is the K value, meaning that this downlink uh, control channel can point to the channel that is immediately in the same frame, or for example, uplink can indicate this K1 that it's only in the next frame you have some resources in uplink to transmit. So all the transmissions happens for data. It's a scheduled operation always. Layer one control channel tells each device when it receives something or when it can transmit something in the uplink direction. Downlink share channel indeed follows, follows the control channel. Like shown here, there is this already mentioned demodulation reference signals and then the data that follows after that. Modulation range uh, runs until 256 quam and Maybe in the future we'll introduce till this uh, 1024 come uh, to the specifications. New element for the millimeter waves is there shown on blue in the middle of the figure is this downlink phase tracking reference signals, which means that uh, we repeat periodically in time in, in frequency domain and it's a continuous signal in time that allows the receiver to compensate for the phase noise that, uh, that you're getting with the high frequencies. So it's a continuous signal uh, available to aid the receiver operation. How often that occurs is then the network parameter to be configured. In uplink direction, we have this uplink share channel carrying all the user data in the uplink direction. And um, allocation is based, as shown earlier, on this physical downlink con control channel signaling. And here, indeed, we have the OFDMA possibility, as well as the single carrier uh, uplink operation with this DFT spread OFDMA is often also the term used. And the same set of modulations, except we have this pi over 2 PPSK additionally available in the uplink direction. And here, naturally, each device sends its own device-specific uh, demodulation reference signals. Physical uplink control channel is then one that carries the layer one control information in the uplink direction. Here also, 
the devices can send this without scheduling as well. So that if there's no scheduling, uh, sh scheduled uplink transmission, it's the physical uplink control channel, the device sent the scheduling request, indicating that there's now data in the buffers to be transmitted. Depending how much data we have to transmit, we use either this polar coding or then Reed Muller if we have less than 12 bits to be transmitted. And uh, depending how much data we have to transmit, short or format, PUCZ format to be used. Besides this uh, feedback for hybrid air queue, then here we send information in the uplink direction that what is a channel situation uh, that allows the base station to operate with the link adaptation, as well as selecting the correct rank, what kind of MIMO, uh, MIMO order to use is it one stream, two stream, four streams, and uh, select the correct uh, uh, transmit uh, recorder in, 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 in downlink MIMO operation as well. Uh, physical random access channel, PRATCH. Here we do see the impact of the beamforming operation in a sense that uh, when the device listens the downlink beam sweep signal, it now has to figure out that what moment in time and frequency, of course, is, is the correct point to transmit in downlink direction so that um, we are able to, uh, to transmit in uplink direction so that the device is able to send its random access message towards the base station at that point in time that the base station is listening to the direction where the device is located. If the device was uh, in the beam num number three direction, it doesn't work if the device transmits the PRATS preamble when the base station is listening to the other direction. But it has to transmit when the base station is listening to that direction that the device measured to be best for itself. So that's this beam association refer reference here. And especially vital when we go to this millimeter wave operation. As recall, base station can only listen to one beam direction at a time if there's only one panel in use. So this brings to my, to my summary of the, of the presentation. So release 15 5G provides this kind of high performance radio which supports large bandwidth 100 megahertz on this, uh, what I call FR frequency range one, sub six gigahertz, or smaller than seven actually nowadays, and advanced MIMO and beam forming as well as low latency. We have this uh, millimeter wave, 26, 28 gigahertz, part of the release 15, but uh, it will be used with some markets only at first. So for example, devices you could buy uh, here in Finland, typically they don't support the millimeter wave because why would they? Because none of the operators have deployed that. So there are a couple of markets like USA where the millimeter wave band is supported and then there are some device models that support that on, on that market available. Uh, the physical layer with first phase devices comes with the dual connectivity supporting both LTE and 5G and the second generation of 5G devices that are coming on the market this year are supporting this kind of 5G only mode that you can operate without the LT on the side. And the design really enables both low latency and high data rates, as well as high reliability. But uh, there are, of course, more features for industrial IoT to, to follow, with, uh, which brings then better reliability. But that is a time of another talk, talk in another time and another place. But thank you from my point of view for your interest today and um, I expect we might have some questions coming up. Yes, we have one question here. And Thank you. If there's going to come more questions, they're going to Yes, yeah, so FFT, yes, so FFT is indeed this uh, fast Fourier transform. So uh, that is what we are using in the 
traditionally in the off DMA and also in the single carry operation. And there we use FFT and IFT to create the signal to the correct part of the spectrum. There's nothing here. Now that Just uh, refresh it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So let's see what kind of questions you got there. So why are uplink speeds usually lower than downlink speed? Do operators set this on purpose or this due to limitation? So that, that was a good question. In, in the first phase 5G that we are now deploying, indeed we are using this 3.5 gigahertz uh, and that is a TDD band. And because most of the traffic is downlink intensive, so the operators, in, in the first of all, have to select this kind of uplink downlink configuration that is matching with the other operators. And that often means that much more resources is available in the first phase for the downlink direction because tra traffic is downlink heavy, often 10 times more traffic in downlink direction than the uplink direction. And the devices in the first phase also, they do support four stream MIMO uh, in the downlink direction, but typically just a single stream transmission in, in the uplink direction. So that fact that less uplink resources and four stream MIMO in downlink also creates this kind of difference, what kind of practical data rates you can get in downlink compared to uplink. And that's why the downlink data rates are, peak data rates are so much higher that and then available in the uplink direction. So about the 5G waveform and overheating, so meaning that um, that's why the wave, waveform, especially in the device transmission, is, is important. Because uh, off DMA waveform consists of the several parallel subcarriers in frequency domain. They look very nicely. But in time domain, that basically means that you have a lot of signals on top of each other. And when the older signals happen to be on this kind of same phase, then uh, they add together on the amplitude. And which means the amplitude varies a lot in the off DMA case. Whereas in the single carrier, the amplitude stays constant. And that means that the device using the off DMA transmission has to uh, avoid from the amplifier side to reach this kind of saturation point. And when the signal has a lot of variation, on the average, you have to operate very low level, which means that you are running, operating the amplifier with the low efficiency to get this necessary output power. And when the amplifier efficiency is low, then you create a lot of heat, and that makes the device hot from the temperature point of view. And you have a lot of power to dissipate away from the device in that case. And, and uh, what else? Uh, then about these use cases for augmented reality. Uh, my, myself not been not dealing with uh, so much on the on the application layer, but uh, augmented reality, of course, uh, has has been considered that uh, there are two areas. Uh, one thing is this kind of like, uh, like uh, if I take uh, industrial type of use cases where one is, for example, uh, repairing some machinery, you could have uh, uh, identification of the parts of the machine or instructions augmented to you. Uh, other element is this kind of the consumer dimension where that would include uh, things like uh, you are in a shop seeing some products, you would have this kind of glasses or pointing 
pointing your camera towards that and this product information would appear, maybe reviews, short videos about the product. Uh, and of course, then this kind of all this kind of other types, entertainment and gaming type of use cases like, like shown here. I do expect the pure virtual reality itself is more like a static, but this augmented reality, mixed reality is, is, is something that is more suited also for this kind of real mobile use cases. So we'll take the next. So, so what is the difference between public and private 5G networks? Is it something along the line of private and public internet or, or different? Uh, from the 5G point of view, we can have a, like a private network in, in, in many ways. In, uh, in some countries, take Germany or, uh, uh, or for example, I think Japan, Sweden, uh, part of this 3.5 gigahertz spectrum has been reserved for this kind of like industrial establishments that could set up a public network, private network, sorry, which means that that network could be using a specific part of the spectrum. Uh, but other approach is that uh, uh, we have also this uh, concept of non-public networks in the 16 version of the specification. There, somebody running a, a, a private network in an airport, for example, could lease part of the spectrum from an operator that owns the license and network would have its own ID and only those devices that belong to that uh, private network would be able to access that network. And the third approach is that uh, we, we could use with 5G the 5 gigahertz unlicensed spectrum. That's something also included now in release 16. And there the 5G network could run on unlicensed spectrum, five gigahertz unlicensed spectrum, and of course then accepting only those devices that have the right to access that particle network that would be joining like their home, consider that as their home network. Same way, a little bit like a Wi-Fi would be that only some Wi-Fi networks of course accept only specific devices have access rights to the Wi-Fi network. So the, does the maximum amount of beams for a certain base station limit the amount of devices that have been connected to it? Or can multiple devices share a beam if they are close enough, close together? Um, indeed, that when we have certain number of beams in use, uh, if the devices are very much scattered, that certainly limits the number of devices we can serve at the time. It could be that the devices are so scattered that they, only one device can be served at a time. But then if the devices are in this kind of like close to each other, like a group of people, then of course the one beam itself can be used to share, uh, serve and, and share data uh, between multiple devices. So one transmission can contain multiple physical downlink control channels and their indicating for different devices that you take this part of the spectrum, other device takes this part of the spectrum and, and so forth, um, even if you don't have this multi-user MIMO in, in, in place. So that is also one strength if you think about uh, one is, when one is you comparing on the unlicensed band solutions with Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi only serves one device at the time, whereas with the 5G you can serve multiple devices simultaneously as long as you don't have this kind of beam specific direction uh, or beam, beam, beam related direction in, in place. So then the question can this high frequency 5G utilizes for loca location purposes, the same way as Wi Fi round trip time? Uh, we do have in release 15 actually, first phase, we don't include too much of this position location. We have things like cell ID and, and satellite assistance. But in release 16, we have included these approaches that uh, we can do this uh, position location and uh, 
and then it's indeed these millimeter waves are interesting because there you can take this uh, uh, time, how long it takes for the signal to go, this timing advance basically from the device as well as this beam direction and, um, and the device space measurement can have a very high resolution of course in time domain because the simple duration is very short. So yes, this position location is, is part of the 5G but it's not in the first phase release, but in the release 16. In the earlier releases, assume that we are using LTE for the position location, or then the satellite-based solutions. Then this is more how the current T, for example, enhanced mobile broadband in 5G core network lies, if the core network is virtualized. I mean, is there any approaches for deploying the EPC components to guarantee enhanced mobile broadband. So when we have a fewer 5G radio, as such, it doesn't, of course, connect to EPC, it connects to the 5G core. And this, this, uh, this slicing is, of course, only supported together with the 5G core. On, on the radio side, there's not much defined by the standards for ensuring the radio can reserve a certain amount of resources for particle slice and it can identify from the signaling from the radio that okay this device become, belongs to the particle slice but then it's more like cellular implementation in the base station than how much resources and how strictly we, we reserve them for particle users and then also for operator determination that uh, how do we define that is it a 10% of a capacity or is it some minimum data rate? What is the guaranteed set of resources for particle, particle type of traffic? But, uh, but it can be done, but a uh, lot of details depend on a particle implementation and not about, uh, not about standard itself. So uh, in Australia, we have many antenna towers and uh, three main operators strongly competing. That may explain the community fear. Can these antenna towers get cleaned up so we can get beautiful antenna towers everywhere with 5G? Uh, it, it, indeed, uh, 5G, of course, itself will, will benefit from the, from the fact that if you have a big antenna tower itself and you can post, place the antenna high enough, then you do get good coverage from that. But uh, uh, when, when we go to this kind of uh, millimeter waves, when we do these hotspots, there of course we can do so that uh, some, in some cases the antennas could be actually very small to serve, for example, be this libra libraries, airports, hotspot, that they don't have to be uh, that huge. But if you want to cover it in a huge area, use a very low frequency band, there still, unfortunately, you don't get this hot, big, rid of these big masts, unfortunately. I think this concludes the questions we were getting so far. So thank you for your attention today and uh, Good luck with your related project work and related activities on this one. Thank you.